All right, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Connor Turner. I am a recent graduate of Dartmouth College, and I'm the founder of The Diamond, where I post original baseball commentary, analysis, videos, and research. Today, I wanna to talk with you a little bit about that research. And in particular, I wanna talk about everybody's favorite subject, Markov chains. Specifically, I wanna talk about how the predictive power of Markov chains can give us a ton of insight into the pitcher batter matchup and can even help us to predict some of the outcomes in those matchups. And to help us understand why this is so important, I wanna start things off with a little bit of a scenario here. Let's say you're in charge of managing a ball club and you're in the middle of a game. It's the bottom of the seventh inning and you're down by one run. The first batter in the inning strikes out. However, your second hitter manages to get a hold of one and he lines one in the gap for a double. So now you're looking at a runner on second, the tying run on second with only one out. Realistically, you just need a ball hit to the right side. And ideally you'd like a ball hit through the infield to try and score that run. The opposing team knows this, so trying to stop you, they bring in their best reliever out of the bullpen. Now, your sixth hitter is coming up to the plate. He can hold his own at the dish, but he's far from the best hitter on your squad. This leaves you with an important decision to make, one that can make or break your entire ball game. You can either stick with your sixth hitter and take your chances with the new pitcher, or you can take one of the guys on your bench and pinch hit for him. So the question here is pretty clear. Do you send in a pinch hitter? And if so, who do you send up? It's an easy question to wrap your mind around conceptually, but when it comes to actually answering it, it's a lot more difficult, especially because in order to answer that question and be confident about the answer, you have to be able to calculate the probability of success for every single one of those hitters against that specific pitcher, which of course is a lot easier said than done. But with that being said, baseball researchers have been looking into this problem for decades. Like a lot of things in baseball research, it really started with Bill James, whose famous log five model was applied to basic outcome at, uh, at bat outcomes. And after that, we've seen a ton of different models trying to look at the same situation. Some have used more standard regression models. A good example of this is probably the outcome predictor over at Fangraphs. Some have used more complicated models. For example, a nuclear penalized, nu uh, nuclear penalized multinomial regression model. Even at this very conference, we're seeing yet another way of looking at this with singularity, which uses machine learning algorithms and neural networks to look at this problem in another lens. And if you haven't heard anything or read anything about them, I highly recommend that you go check out their presentation tomorrow because they're doing some insane work over there. But for right now, I want to present yet another way of looking at this pinch hitter problem. And as the title might suggest, that has to do with Markov chains. Now, I know we're all stats nerds here, so I'm sure some of you are familiar with the concept of Markov chains. But for those of you who might not be as familiar or might be learning about it for the first time, I wanna start with a little bit of an introduction to the subject. To put it in as basic terms as possible, a Markov chain is a system that is made up of a set of distinct and connected states where you can move from one state to another with a certain probability. And this is a very powerful tool because if we can study how people move from one state to another, we can use that information to make inferences about where people will go and where people will end up in the future. There are two main types of Markov chains, but for our purposes here today, we're only gonna be focusing on one of them, which is the absorbing Markov chain. Now, for those of you who just listened to all that, we're like, what was all that word vomit? <laughs> Here's a visual representation of what I'm talking about here. What you're seeing is a basic representation of an absorbing Markov chain with five different states. And our goal here is to use the data of how people move from state to state to make inferences about how people will move through the states in the future. Let's say we start off here in the middle with state number two. After one iteration of the chain, if we start at state number two, we have a 50% chance of moving to the right, a 35% chance of moving to the left, and a 15% chance of staying where we are at state number two. 
States one, two, and three here are what we would refer to as transient states, which means that you can move from one state to another fairly freely. And these numbers that you see around this diagram, those are our transition probabilities, which are usually based off of real world data of how people move from state to state in the past. And as you move from state to state, those transition probabilities change along with it. For example, if after that first iteration, we end up at state one, we now have a 25% chance of returning to state two, a 50% chance of going to state L, and a 25% chance of staying where we are at state one in the next move. This goes on and on and back and forth as we go up and down through the chain until we reach an absorbing state, which in this case is state L and state R. These are so-called because once you reach these states, you are absorbed into them, meaning that once you reach state L, for example, you are basically staying there in perpetuity. You cannot go to any other states after that. This is an important concept that we're going to come back to in just a few minutes. Now, most Markov chains are a lot more complicated than this one, and as such, they're a lot harder to represent in a diagram like this one. So instead of drawing a diagram like this, we tend to use something called a transition matrix, which as you can probably gather, is a matrix that represents a Markov chain by putting together all of the different transition probabilities between states. In a typical transition matrix, all of the rows represent the state you are currently in or your starting state. And all of the columns represent the state you are going to or your ending state. Notice how we have all our transient states on the left and on the top and our absorbing states on the right and the bottom. This transition matrix gives us a pretty nifty shorthand for trying to figure out these transition probabilities. For example, if we wanna find the transition probability of going from state two to state three, all we have to do is go down to row number two, transfer over to state or tra transfer over to row or column number three, and we find that that answer is 50%. However, without all being said, transition matrices are not just for show. In fact, they have some really special characteristics about them that are going to allow us to do some really cool things going forward. And here's where things get really interesting. See, every transition matrix is what we would call a stochastic matrix. And this basically means that every entry in the matrix, every entry in the rows, all equals to one. So in this case, 25 plus 25 plus 50. This is going to be something that's going to allow our model to work once we build it up later on in this presentation. And here's why. See, when we've looked at this transition matrix, it's only been for the first iteration of the chain, the first move. But what if we wanted to figure out, for example, the probability of going from state one to state three after two moves of the chain or two iterations? Because of the stochastic nature of this matrix, we can actually do that pretty easily. All we'd have to do is take this matrix and multiply it by itself, take it to the second power. And we see that that probability is 12.5%. And as you go higher and higher with your iterations, this continues to be the case. If you want to see the 10th iteration, you take it to the 10th power. If you want to see the 100th, you take it to the 100th, so on and so forth. But as you go higher and higher, something interesting starts to happen. You start to notice that um, as you go higher, you reach a point where no matter how many iterations you do, your matrix always stays the same. And that basically means that t to the 1001 is equal to t to the 1002 is equal to t to the 1003, so on and so forth. This is what we refer to as our steady state matrix. It gives us the generalized probability of ending up in a certain state given our starting state. And because we are looking at an absorbing Markov chain here, we have an extra characteristic that's going to add an, an, another layer to this. As you notice, as we go higher and higher with the iterations, all of these entries that you see off to the left under our transient states, these all go down to zero only leaving values underneath our absorbing states. This allows us to condense the matrix down into something that I like to call the outcome matrix. And this gives us the general probability of ending up in a certain absorbing state 
given our starting state. And as you can see here, based on whatever starting state you're in, those probabilities can vary quite a bit. And this is another concept that we're gonna come back to in just a few minutes. Now, at this point, I'm a little over halfway through my time and I'm sure some of you are out there wondering, Connor, that's pretty cool and all, but what does this actually have to do with baseball? Well, when I was first introduced to the concept of Markov chains, it just so happened to be in a class that was focused on sports analytics. So I guess I had sports on the mind. But as the professor was going through the concepts and explaining how everything worked, I had a thought come into my head that I couldn't really get out. And that thought was, we can model at-bats as an absorbing Markov chain. That day after class, I went straight back to my dorm. I pulled out a notebook and I drew a very basic diagram, which looked kind of like this. And this will show you where I'm going at here. See, every hitter starts here at the top of the pyramid with a zero zero count. And from there, they have three paths open to them. They can hit a ball and play and end the at bat there. They can take a strike and go down 0 and 1, or they can take a ball and go up 1 and 0. And as they go down this pyramid and down the various counts, they have those same general paths open to them until they reach a certain outcome, a walk, a strikeout, or a ball in play. With this basic concept in mind, what we're looking at here is an absorbing Markov chain, where the transient states are the various counts and our absorbing states are our outcomes, our walks, our strikeouts, our balls in play. From this, we can use this information to create a working transition matrix, which looks kind of like this. Now, I know this is a lot to take in at once, so let me walk you through what you're looking at here. This right here is a 19 by 19 transition matrix. It is made up of 12 transient states, which is our various counts that a hitter might face in a given at bat. And in this version of the chain, we have seven absorbing states, which are the seven basic outcomes of an at-bat, a single, a double, a triple, a homer, an out on a ball in play, a strikeout, and a walk. In order to create the transition probabilities that you see here, I used a package in R to scrape StatCast pitch-by-pitch -pitch data. Essentially, I wrote a script that would take the player I was looking at pull up every single pitch that they saw in a certain time period. And then it would break up that data set by count, categorize the pitches by outcome, and I would use those values to create frequencies that I would plug into the matrix for our transition probabilities. And to give you an idea of what this looks like with an actual player, let's take a look at 2019 AL MVP Mike Trout. See, what you're looking at here is a filled out transition matrix that is made up of every single pitch that Mike Trout saw in the 2019 season. And using this matrix, we can actually study the typical at-bat outcomes of 2019 Mike Trout and make predictions about his baseline performance. How? Well, just like our example from earlier, all we have to do is find our steady state. So we take this matrix and we multiply it by itself over and over and over and over again until we reach our steady state and our outcome matrix, which looks like this. This top line that you see here are the expected outcome probabilities of a typical 2019 Mike Trout at bat. As you can see, he's doing pretty well for himself. He's got a 17% chance of a walk, an 8% chance of a homer, and 11% chance of getting a base hit. However, while other models will only give you this top line, this model goes one step further by allowing you to see how this performance changes based on the count as you go through the at-bat. So for example, let's go to two and two over here. When Mike Trout has a two and two count on him, his strikeout probability goes up to about 33%. However, his walk percentage, or walk probability rather, goes up from 17% to nearly 21%. And as we look at this top line compared to the percentages from the 2019 season that he actually had, we can see that this model gives us a pretty good understanding of Mike Trout's baseline performance in a typical at-bat. But where things get really interesting is when we add a pitcher into the mix. 
For example, let's take Mike Trout's counterpart, 2019 AL Cy Young winner Justin Verlander. For Verlander, we go through the same process. We pull up all of his pitches from 2019, and we use that data to create a transition matrix for him. But unlike what we just did, there's another step that we have to do before we go to our outcome matrix. We have to somehow find a way to put these transition matrices together. Because after all, we're trying to figure out the outcomes of an at-bat between the two. At first glance, you might think this would be the most complicated part of this model. And that's what I thought at first, too. I mean, I spent hours trying to figure out the best way to do this until I realized that the best way also happened to be the easiest. And that was just to take the average of the two matrices. This works out really well for us for two main reasons. One, it takes the inputs from both players as equals. And two, as it turns out, the average matrix of two stochastic matrices is itself a stochastic matrix, which allows us to have this model run in the first place. So our transition matrix for the Trout and Verlander at bat looks kind of like this. And just like we did with Trout, we can use this to create our steady state and our outcome matrix for the combined at bat. For reference here, I have the typical trout performance that we just looked up a few minutes ago. And here is that same performance evaluation against Justin Verlander. Immediately, you can start to see some stark differences between the two. The first thing that really comes to mind for me is the strikeout probability. 2019 Justin Verlander was one of the best strikeout pitchers that we've seen in recent years. And that impact is really felt here. As Trout's typical strikeout probability goes up from 21% to nearly 29%. And as we go through the at-bat, it just looks worse and worse for Trout. Because if he goes down 0-1, it goes up to 37.5%. And if he goes down 0-2, it goes up to 53% which is insane to think about. And just from this short analysis here, we can start to see why this model would be really interesting and powerful for baseball analysts. Not only can we see the most likely at-bat outcomes in an at-bat between two specific players, but we can also see how those, how those performances are impact as the, we can see how those performances are impacted as the at-bat goes on, which I think is a really important impact to see in terms of determining and looking at how the pitcher and the hitter attack each at-bat and really approach their plate appearances. Not only this, but we can take this insight one step further by using these probabilities to create expected stats. For example, if we want to find the expected on base percentage, all we'd have to do is add up the probabilities of all the hits and the walk. If we want to find expected slugging percentage, we would just take the probabilities for our hits and multiply them by their various base values. And if you want to find the WOBA, you take the hits and the walks and you multiply them by their various WOBA weights. So in conclusion here, you can start to see why this model would not only be a really cool model to run some interesting hypotheticals for amateur baseball researchers, but it could also be a very powerful tool for people who work in the front offices and in the dugouts. One that can hopefully take some of the uncertainty out of all these really stressful decisions they have to make on a game-to-game -game basis, such as the pinch hitter problem. With that being said, I want to thank you for your time and for your attention. If you want to learn more about the model and how it all works, you can read the full paper on my website, readthediamond.com. And if you have questions that I'm not able to get to in the Q&A, you can feel free to reach out to me either through email or on Twitter, which, by the way, our Twitter account and our YouTube channel are doing a giveaway right now. So if you want to check that out, I highly recommend it. But for right now, I want to thank you for your time once again. I want to thank Sabre again for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. I'll leave this up for just a second as I try to scroll through some of the questions here. All right. Wow, looks like we got a lot here. If I can pull it up. 
I apologize, everyone. I'm not sure why the Q&A isn't popping up for me here. Perhaps if I stop sharing. Okay, perfect. Hopefully everybody can still see me okay. All right, so the first question is going to be from Christian and he asks, where does hit by pitch fall in the matrix? Well, hit by pitch was actually filtered out of the data set along with catcher's interference. And the reason why was because I didn't feel like it was particularly relevant for what I wanted to do. But the, cool, the really cool thing about this model is that you can really make it as granular or as wide as you want. I did not include hit by pitch in my version, but if you wanted to, you could. I just don't think it happens really often enough to make an impact unless you're, say, Tim LaCastro. All right, next question is from Kyle Godwin. Will you ever be able to factor in the probability of flyouts and groundouts and where the ball would go? I think this is a really interesting question. I believe that you could, but the one thing that I would be wary of is probably um, sample size. One of the main limitations with this model is sample size because we are breaking up the data set by count. So we want to make sure that all of the outcome variables and all of the counts have enough sample size within them to really give us a pretty good normal distribution and a good representation of where the hitter's true baseline really is. So to answer your question, I believe we absolutely could. And I think that could be the next step forward for a model like this. But we also need to be wary about that sample size. Very good question. All right, next question is from Jim. I've played with these type of models for a while, but I would question your weighting of the pitcher and batter matrices. I would doubt that the best weights are 50-50. It would be interesting to use some criteria to find the best weights. And I totally agree with that. It absolutely could be the case that the best weight isn't 50-50. The real issue with adding weights to the mixture is one, making sure that those weights are correct, which is going to be a very time consuming process, but I think it is going to be a very useful process for improving this model going forward. But also because we have to keep that stochastic nature of the matrix in mind. Whatever we do to combine those two matrices together, we have to come up with a stochastic matrix at the end of the day so that we can actually run this model and get to an outcome matrix. So that's absolutely something that should be looked at in the future, but it's something that we have to be careful with in terms of making sure that we can actually get an outcome from the model. But very good insight there. Austin asks, are you able to use a Markov chain for players that haven't played against each other? Would that just be the outcome matrix that he had for Trout by himself? So actually, this is one of the reasons why I made this model in the first place. Typically, when we look at projecting an at-bat matchup, we typically look at it through the lens of, oh, well, he's had 30 at-bats against him, and here's what he's done. But with most at-bats, you can't really do that. See, uh, you don't get enough of a sample size to really get a good sense of the true probability of what's going to happen. So I made this model as a way to fix that problem to where you can take the baseline performance of both players and use that to try and figure out a better way of predicting what will happen. So very good question there. Alex asks, for the hitter pitcher scenario, would you consider trying to give more weight to the pitcher matrix given that pitchers can arguably control at-bats more than the hitter. Yeah, I would consider that. And I think it's something to be looked at. Like I mentioned earlier with the other question about waiting, I do believe that pitchers have more control over the at-bats, but I also believe that it's really the hitter's job to take what the pitcher gives you and try and do something with it. So the hitter's contributions have to be brought into it and they have to play a significant role. Just how much of a role they actually need to play, that might be up for discussion right now. But for right now, 
the 50-50 weighting is the best way that I've found. Okay, I've got one more question here. And this is going to be from Michael. In the pinch hitter decision scenario, if the pitcher is the same, doesn't this mean that hitters whose outcome matrices are better by themselves are also better when compared to the same pitchers? Generally, but there's some caveats here. See, one of the things that makes this model, or at least gives this model of advantage over other models is that we can see how the approach at the plate really affects things. So things like how aggressive you are at the plate in terms of swinging the bat and what kind of contact you make and how selective you are at the plate, those are really going to play a factor in how that particular pinch hitter scenario is going to go. So generally I would say yes, but there's some caveats there in that different characteristics about different batters are going to breed different outcomes against certain types of pitchers. So that's what I would say to that. Thank you so much for all these amazing questions. And again, thank you to Sabre for this amazing opportunity. Appreciate your time.